chapter 2 space and time our present ideas about the motion of bodies date back to galileo and newton before them people believed aristotle who said that the natural state of a body was to be at rest and that it moved only if driven by a force or impulse it followed that a heavy body should fall faster than a light one because it would have a greater pull towards the earth the aristotelian tradition also held that one could work out all the law that govern the universe by pure thought it was not necessary to check by observation so no one until galileo bothered to see whether bodies of different weight did in fact fall at different speeds it is said that galileo demonstrated that aristotle's belief was false by dropping weight from the leaning tower of pisa the story is almost certainly untrue but galileo did do something equivalent he rolled balls of different weights down a smooth slope the situation is similar to that of heavy body falling vertically but it is easier to observe because the speed are smaller galileo's measurements indicated that each body increased its speed at the same rate no matter what it weight for example if you let go of a ball on a slope that drop by 1 meter for every 10 meters you go along the ball will be traveling down the slope at a speed of about 1 meter per second after 1 second 2 meter per second after 2 seconds and so on however heavy the ball of course a lead weight would fall faster than a feather but that is only because a feather is slowed down by air resistance if one drops down two bodies that doesn't have much air resistance such as two different lead weights they fall at the same rate on the moon where there is no air to slow things down the astronaut david r scott performed the feather and lead weight experiment and found that indeed they did hit the ground at the same time galileo's measurements were used by newton as the basis of his law of motion in galileo's experiment as a body rolled down the slope it was always acted on by same force it weights and the effect was to make it constantly speed up this showed that the real effect of a force is always to change the speed of a body rather than just to see it moving was previously thought it also meant that whenever a body is not acted on by any force it will keep on moving in a straight line at the same speed this idea was first stated explicitly in newton's principia mathematica published in 1687 and is known as newton's first law what happens to a body when a force does act on it is given by newton's second law this state that the body will accelerate or change its speed at a rate that is proportional to the force for example the acceleration is twice as great if the force is twice as great the acceleration is also smaller the greater the mass or quantity of mass of the body the same force acting on a body of twice the mass will produce half the acceleration a familiar example is provided by a car the more powerful the engine the greater the acceleration but the heavier the car the smaller the acceleration for the same engine in addition to his law of motion newton discovered a law to describe the force of gravity which state that every body attracts every other body with a force that is proportional to mass of each body thus the force between two bodies would be twice as strong if one of the bodies says body a had its mass doubled this is what you might expect because one could think of the new body a as being made of two bodies with the original mass each would attract body b with the original force thus the total force between a and b would be twice the original force and if says one of this body had twice the mass and the other had 
थ्री टाइम्स द मास देन द फोर्स वुड बी सिक्स टाइम्स एज स्ट्रॉन्ग वन कैन नाउ सी वाई ऑल बॉडीज फॉल एट सेम रेट अ बॉडी ऑफ ट्वाइस द वेट विल हैव ट्वाइस द फोर्स ऑफ ग्रेविटी पुलिंग इट डाउन बट इट विल ऑल्सो हैव ट्वाइस द मास अकॉर्डिंग टू न्यूटन सेकेंड लॉ दिस टू इफेक्ट विल एग्जैक्टली कैंसल ईच अदर सो द एसिलेशन विल बी द सेम इन ऑल केसेस न्यूटन्स लॉ ऑफ ग्रेविटी ऑल्सो टेल्स इज दैट फादर अ पार्ट दिस बॉडी द स्मॉलर द फोर्स न्यूटन्स लॉ ऑफ ग्रेविटी से इज दैट द ग्रेविटेशनल अट्रैक्शन ऑफ अ स्टार इज एक्जैक्टली वन क्वार्टर दैन ऑफ सिमिलर स्टार एट हाफ द डिस्टेंस दिस लॉ प्रेडिक्ट द ऑर्बिट ऑफ द अर्थ एंड द मून एंड द प्लानट विद ग्रेट एक्यूरेसी इफ द लॉ वेर दैट द ग्रेविटेशनल अट्रैक्शन ऑफ अ स्टार वेन डाउन फास्टर और इंक्रीज मोर रैपिडली विद डिस्टेंस द ऑर्बिट ऑफ द प्लानट वुड नॉट बी इलेक्ट्रिकल दे वुड आइदर स्पायरल इन टू द सन और एस्केप फ्रॉम द सन द डिफरेंस बिटवीन द आइडर्स ऑफ एरिस्टोटल एंड दोस ऑफ गैलिलियो एंड न्यूटन इज दैट एरिस्टोटल बिलीव्ड इन अ प्रेफर्ड स्टेट ऑफ रेस्ट विच एनी बॉडी वुड टेक अप इफ इट वेर नॉट ड्राइवन बाय सम फोर्स और इम्पल्स इन पर्टिकुलर ही थॉट दैट द अर्थ वॉज एट रेस्ट बट इट फॉलोज फ्रॉम न्यूटन्स लॉ दैट देर इज नो यूनिक स्टैंडर्ड ऑफ रेस्ट वन कूड इक्वली वेल से दैट बॉडी ए वॉज एट रेस्ट एंड बॉडी बी वॉज मूविंग एट कॉन्स्टेंट पीड विथ रिस्पेक्ट टू बॉडी ए और दैट बॉडी बी वॉज एट रेस्ट एंड बॉडी ए वॉज मूविंग फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ वन सेट्स अ साइड फॉर अ मोमेंट द रोटेशन ऑफ द अर्थ एंड इट्स ऑर्बिट अराउंड द सन वन कूड से दैट द अर्थ वॉज एट रेस्ट एंड दैट अ ट्रेन ऑन इट वॉज ट्रैवलिंग नॉर्थ एट नाइंटी माइल्स पर आर और दैट द ट्रेन वॉज एट रेस्ट एंड द अर्थ वॉज मूविंग साउथ एट नाइंटी माइल्स पर आर इफ वन कैरिड आउट एक्सपेरिमेंट्स विथ मूविंग बॉडीज ऑन द ट्रेन ऑल न्यूटन्स लॉ वुड स्टील होल्ड फॉर इंस्टेंस प्लेइंग पिंग पॉन्ग ऑन द ट्रेन वन वुड फाइंड दैट द बॉल ओबेड न्यूटन्स लॉ जस्ट लाइक अ बॉल ऑन अ टेबल बाय द ट्रैक सो देर इज नो वे टू टेल वेदर इट इज द ट्रेन और द अर्थ दैट इज मूविंग द लैक ऑफ एन एब्सुलट स्टैंडर्ड ऑफ रेस्ट मीन दैट वन कूड नॉट डिटमाइन वेदर टू इवेंट्स दैट टूक प्लेस एट डिफरेंट टाइम्स ऑकर इन द सेम पोजिशन इन स्पेस फॉर एग्जाम्पल सपोज आर पिंग पॉन्ग बॉल ऑन द ट्रेन बाउंसेज स्ट्रेट अप एंड डाउन हीटिंग द टेबल ट्वाइस ऑन द सेम स्पॉट वन सेकेंड अ पार्ट टू सम वन ऑन द ट्रैक द टू बाउंसेज वुड सीम टू टेक प्लेस अबाउट फोर्टी मीटर अ पार्ट बिकॉज द ट्रेन वुड हैव ट्रैवल्ड दैट फार डाउन द ट्रैक बिटवीन द बाउंसेज द नॉन एक्सिस्टेंस ऑफ एब्सुलट रेस्ट डेफो मेन दैट वन कूड नॉट गिव एन इवेंट एन एब्सुलट पोजिशन इन स्पेस एज एरिस्टोटल हैड बिलीव्ड द पोजिशन ऑफ इवेंट एंड द डिस्टेंस बिटवीन दैम वुड बी डिफरेंट फॉर अ पर्सन ऑन द ट्रेन एंड ऑन द ट्रैक एंड देर वुड बी नो रीजन टू प्रेफर वन पर्सन पोजिशन टू द अदर्स न्यूटन वॉज वेरी वरीड बाय दिस लैक ऑफ एब्सुलट पोजिशन और एब्सुलट स्पेस एज इट वॉज कॉल्ड बिकॉज इट डिड नॉट एकॉर्ड विथ his idea of any absolute god in fact he refused to accept lack of absolute space even though it was implied by his laws he was severely criticized for his irrational beliefs by many people most notably by bishop brickley a philosopher who believed that all material objects and space and time are an illusion When the famous Dr Johnson was told of Brickley's opinion he cried I refute it thus and stopped his toe on a large stone Both Aristotle and Newton believe in absolute time that is they believe that one could unambiguously measure the interval of time between two events and that 
this time would be the same whoever measured it provided they used a good clock time was completely separate from and independent of space this is what most people would take to be the common sense view however we have to change our ideas about space and time although our apparently common sense notions work well when dealing with things like apples or planets and that travel comparatively slowly they don't work at all for things moving at or near the speed of light the fact that light travels at a finite but very high speed was first discovered in 1676 by danish astronomer ole christensen roma he observed that the time at which the moon of jupiter appeared to pass behind jupiter were not evenly spaced as one would expect if the moons went around jupiter at a constant rate as the earth and jupiter orbit around the sun the distance between them varies romans notice that eclipse of jupiter's moon appear later the father we were from jupiter he argued that this was because the light from the moons took longer to reach us when we were farther away his measurements of the variations in the distance of the earth from jupiter were however not very accurate and so his values for the speed of light was 140000 miles per second compared to modern value of 186000 miles per second nevertheless romer's achievements in not only proving that light travel at a finite speed but also in measuring that speed was remarkable coming as it did 11 years before newton's publications of principia mathematica a proper theory of the propagation of light didn't come until 1865 when the british physicist James Clerk Maxwell succeeded in unifying the partial theories that up to then had been used to describe the forces of electricity and magnetism. Maxwell's equation predicted that there could be wave-like disturbances in the combined electromagnetic field and that this would travel at a fixed speed like ripples on a pond if the wavelength of these waves the distance between one wave crest and the next is a meter or more they are what we now call radio waves shorter wavelengths are known as microwaves a few centimeters or infrared more than 10000 of centimeters visible light has a wavelength of between only 40 and 80 millimeters of a centimeter even shorter wavelengths are known as ultraviolet x rays and gamma rays maxwell's theory predicted that the ra- radio or light waves should travel at a certain fixed speed but the newton's theory had got rid of the idea of the absolute rest so if light was supposed to travel at a fixed speed one would have to say what that fixed speed was to be measured relative to it was therefore suggested that there was a substance called the ether that was present everywhere even in empty space light wave should travel through the ether as sound waves travel through air and their speed should therefore be relative to the ether different observers moving relative to the ether would see light coming towards them at the sp- different speeds but light speed relative to the ether would remain fixed in particular as the earth was moving through the ether on its orbit round the sun the speed of the light measured in the direction of the earth's motion through the ether when we were moving towards the source of the light should be higher than the speed of light at right angle to the motion when we are not moving towards the source in 1887 albert 
Michelson, who later became the first American to receive the Nobel Prize for Physics, and Edward Molray carried out a very careful experiment at the Case School of Applied Science in Cleveland. They compared the speed of light in the direction of the Earth's motion with that at the right angles to the earth motion to their great surprise they found that they were exactly the same between 1887 and 1905 there were several attempts most notably by the dutch physicist hendrik lorentz to explain the result of the michelson model experiment in terms of objects contracting and clocks slowing down when they move through the ether However, in a famous paper in 1905, a hitherto unknown clerk in the Swiss patent office, Albert Einstein, pointed out that the whole idea of an ether was unnecessary, providing one was willing to abandon the idea of absolute time. A similar point was made a few weeks later by the leading French mathematician Henri Poincaré. Einstein's arguments were closer to physics than those of Poincaré, who regarded this problem as mathematically. Einstein is usually given the credit for the new theory, but Poincaré is remembered by having his name attached to an important part of it. The fundamental postulate of the theory of relativity, as it was called, was the law of science should be the same for all freely moving observers, no matter what their speed. This was true for Newton's law of motion, but now the idea was extended to include Maxwell's theory and the speed of light. All observers should measure the same speed of the light, no matter how fast they are moving. The simple idea has come remarkable consequences. Perhaps the best known was the equivalence of mass and energy, summed up in Einstein's famous equation E is equals to mc square, where E is energy, m is mass, and c is the speed of light, and the law that nothing may travel faster than the speed of light. Because of the equivalence of energy and mass, the energy which an object has due to its motion will add to its mass. In other words, it will make it harder to increase its speed. This effect is only really significant for objects moving at speeds close to the speed of light. For example, at 10% of the speed of light, an object mass is only 0.5% more than normal, while at 90% of the speed of light, it would be more than twice its normal mass. As an object approaches the speed of light, its mass arises even more quickly, so it takes more and more energy to speed it up further. It can in fact never reach the speed of light, because by then its mass would have become infinite, and by the equivalence of mass and energy, it would have taken an infinite amount of energy to get it there. For this reason, any normal object is forever confined by relativity to move at speed slower than the speed of light. Only light or other waves that have no intrinsic mass can move at the speed of light. An equally remarkable consequence of relativity is the way it has revolutionized our ideas of space and time. In Newton's theory, if a pulse of light is sent from one place to another, different observers would agree on the time that the journey took, since time is absolute, but will not agree of how far the light travelled, since space is not absolute. Since the speed of the light is just the distance it has travelled, divided by the time it has taken, different observers would measure different speeds for the light. In relativity, on the other hand, all observers must agree on how fast light travels. They still, however, do not agree on the distance the light had traveled. So they must therefore now also disagree over the time it has taken. The time taken is the distance the light had traveled, which the observers do not agree on, divided by the light's speed, which they do 
agree on. In other words, the theory of relativity put an end to the idea of absolute time. It appeared that each observer must have its own measure of time, as recorded by a clock carried with him, and the identical clock carried by different observers would not necessarily agree. Each observer could use radar to say whether and when an event took place by sending out a pulse of light or radio waves. Part of the pulse is reflected back at the event and the observer measures the time at which he receives the echo. The time of the event is then said to be the time halfway between when the pulse was sent and the time when the reflection was received back. The distance of the event is half the time taken for this round trip, multiplied by the speed of light. An event in this sense is something that takes place at a single point in space, at a specified point in the time, which is an example of a space-time diagram. Using this procedure, observers who are moving relative to each other will assign different times and positions to the same event. No particular observer's measurements are any more correct than any other observer's, but all the measurements are related. Any observer can work out precisely what time and position of any observer will assign to an event, provided he knows the other observer's relative velocity. Nowadays, we use just this method to measure distance precisely because we can measure time more accurately than length. In effect, the meter is defined to be the distance traveled by light in 0 0.00000003335640952 seconds as measured by a cesium clock. The reason for that particular number is that it corresponds to the historical definition of the meter. In terms of two mark on particular platinum bar kept in Paris. Equally, we can use a more convenient new unit of length called a light second. This is simply defined as the distance that light travel in one second. In the theory of relativity, we now define distance in terms of time and the speed of light. So it follows automatically that every observer will measure light to have the same speed. By definition, 1 meter per 0 0.00000003335640952 seconds. There is no need to introduce the idea of an ether whose presence anyway cannot be detected. As the Michelson small ray experiment showed, the theory of relativity does, however, force us to change fundamentally our ideas of space and time. We must accept that time is not com completely separate from and independent of space, but it is combined with it to form an object called space-time. It is a matter of common experience that one can describe the position of a point in space by three numbers or coordinates. For instance, one can say that a point is in a room is 7 feet from one wall, 3 feet from another and 5 feet above the floor. Or one can specify that a point was at a certain latitude and longitude and a certain height above the sea level. One is free to use any three suitable coordinates, although they have only a limited range of validity. One would not specify the position of the moon in terms of miles north and miles west of Piccadilly Circus and feet above sea level. Instead, one might describe it in terms of distance from the sun, distance from the plane of the orbit of the planets, and the angle between the line joining the moon and the sun and the line joining the sun to nearby stars such as Alpha and Tauri. Even these coordinates would not be of much use in describing the position of the sun in our galaxy or the position of a galaxy in the local group of galaxies. In fact, 
One may describe the whole universe in terms of a collection of overlapping patches. In each patch, one can use a different set of three coordinates to specify the position of a point. An event is something that happens at a particular point in space and a particular time. So one can specify it by four numbers or coordinates. Again, the choice of coordinate is arbitrary. One can use any three well-defined spatial coordinates and any measure of time in relativity. There is no real distinction between the space and time coordinates, just as there is no real difference between any two space coordinates. One could choose a new set of coordinates in which, say, the first space coordinate was a combination of the old first and second space coordinates. For instance, instead of measuring the position of a point on the Earth in miles north of Piccadilly and miles west of Piccadilly, one could use miles northeast of Piccadilly and miles northwest of Piccadilly. Similarly. In relativity, one can use a new time coordinate that was the old time in seconds plus the distance in light seconds not to Piccadilly. It is often helpful to think of the four coordinates of an event as specifying its position in a four-dimensional space called space-time. It is impossible to imagine a four-dimensional space. I personally find it hard enough to visualize three-dimensional space. However, it is easy to draw diagrams of two-dimensional space, such as the surface of the Earth. The surface of the Earth is two-dimensional because the position of a point can be specified by two coordinates, latitude and longitude. I shall generally use diagrams in which time increases upwards and one of the spatial diagrams is shown horizontally. The other two spatial di dimensions are ignored or sometimes one of them is identified by perspective. For example, time is measured upward in years and the distance along the line from the sun to Alpha Centauri is measured horizontally in miles. The path of the sun and of Alpha Centauri through space-time are shown as the vertical lines on the left and right of the diagram. A ray of light from the sun follows the diagonal line and takes four years to get from the sun to alpha century. As we have seen, Maxwell's equation predicted that the speed of light should be the same whatever the speed of the source and this has been confirmed by accurate measurements. It follows from this that if a pulse of light is emitted at a particular time at a particular point in space, then as time goes on, it will spread out as a sphere of light whose size and position of uh, are independent of the speed of the source. After one millionth of a second, the light will have spread out to form a sphere with a radius of 300 meters. After two millionths of a second, the radius will be 600 meters and so on. It will be like the ripples that spread out on the surface of a pond when a stone is thrown in. The ripples spread out as a circle that gets bigger as time goes on. If one stack of snapshots of the ripples at different times one above the other, the expanding circle of the ripples will mark on a cone whose tip is at the place and time at which the stone hit the water. Similarly, the light spreading out from an event form a three-dimensional cone in the four-dimensional space-time. This cone is called the future light cone of the event. In the same way, we can draw another cone called the past light cone, which is the set of events from which a pulse of light is able to reach the given event. Given an event P, one can divide the another event in the universe into three classes. Those events that can be reached from the event P by a particle of wave traveling at or below the speed of light are said to be in the future of P. They will lie within or on the expanding sphere of light emitted from the event P. Thus, they will lie within or on the future light of cone of P in the space-time diagram. Only events in the future of P can be 
affected by what happens at p because nothing can travel faster than the light similarly the past of p can be defined as the set of all events from which it is possible to reach the event p traveling at or below the speed of light it is thus the set of events that can affect what happens at p the events that do not lie in the future or past of p are said to lie in the elsewhere of p what happens at such events can neither affect nor be affected by what happens at p for example if the sun were to kiss to shine at this every moment it would not affect things on earth at the present time because they would be in the elsewhere of the event when the sun went out we would know about it only after 8 minutes the time it takes light to reach us from the sun only then would events on earth lie in the future light cone of the event at which the sun went out similarly we do not know what is happening at the moment farther away in the universe the light that we see from distant galaxies left them millions of years ago and in the case of the most distant objects that we have seen the light left some 8000 million years ago thus when we look at the universe we are seeing it as it was in the past